seara. Am plăcerea să vă aduc în fața dumneavoastră un personaj absolut fără vitamin extraordinar. E domnul Terimie, în persoană. Unul din cei mai importanți realizatori de cinema în lume. Problema este că nu va ține un masterclass clasic, ci unul interactiv. Voi veți pune întrebări și dumneavoastră va răspunde. Este o ocazie, ocazie, să zic așa, unică și pentru dumneavoastră să puteți să le vorbe direct cu el. Vă ajutați cu traducerea, pentru că discuția va fi în engleză. Tere Ghilian. Okay. Uh, welcome the second time in Romania. No, it's the second time. Yes. Uh, the first was the shooting. Now it's the screening. Uh, if you want to say two words first about the shooting, and uh, do you have expectations about uh, this film? If if you have some. Ah, this is tricky because. Um, I try not to have expectations about the film. Um, we made the film. We had an incredible time working here. Um, the crew was wonderful. There's incredible talent here in Romania. Um, and it's been a year since we finished, almost to the day. Uh, and it's been very strange to come back. It's like I never left Bucharest. It's just the weather's the same. And the hotel's the same. There's a few more buildings that have been painted look better. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very nice to be back. Uh, I, I'm very envious of Bucharest. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful city, or such a strange city. But um, I should say, this master class, I should explain because uh, I don't really do master classes. I don't teach. Uh, I'm not interested in being academic. Uh, what I'd like to do is have a conversation with you. Uh, you'll ask me questions. Hopefully I can answer some of your questions. And uh, we'll just keep it as free and as relaxed and easy. And uh, the more you ask me interesting questions, the more likely you're going to get an interesting answer. But, uh, and we'll be doing this in English, unfortunately, uh, because Romania has created a language that I cannot speak. <laughs> ask you to uh, put the question. I, I don't want to take your time for the questions. If somebody wants to start. Oh, it's a bit very peculiar. Who's that? <laughs> I am. Where are you? I'll be. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <coughs> You're Terry Gilliam, aren't you? <laughs> How is it to be Terry Gilliam? How is it to be me? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm stuck inside here. That's why I need you to tell me who Terry Gilliam is. I walk past uh, windows on the street and I see this reflection. And inside here is a, is a man who's 27 years old. And then this reflection in the window is this old fart. This old man walking down the street, you know, pestering me. So it's, it's very difficult. I, I've avoided knowing who Terry Gilliam is. I like, that's why I like making movies, because it gets me outside of myself. Uh, was that a good, good answer or not? You mean, is he a good director? Ah, is he a good director? Well, I, I just was given an honorary doctorate by the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, university. the university today, so somebody must think I'm a good director. My wife doesn't, but the university does, so that's enough for me. <laughs> what does keep you, what does keep you uh, young? Making movies keep you young? It, it's, a, it's a very fine line. Movies, yes, keep me young, but they also keep me old. So it's, I'm caught in the middle. Each movie takes so much energy out of you, and, and as you get older, it becomes harder and harder to get up 
and, the, and working these very long hours. But if I don't make movies, I just get very old very quickly. So uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's one of those curses that you have. I like making, well, I make movies. I, I can't say I like making them. It's what I do now. Uh, if I had been intelligent, I would have stayed being a cartoonist. It's much easier. You just need a piece of paper and a pen. With movies, you need millions of dollars and lots of people to help you create what you're doing. So, they're very different worlds. When I was doing the animation on Python, I just worked alone. I just was always alone, working seven days a week. There would be maybe one or two all-nighters during those weeks, and the work was done. And it's the antithesis of what making a film is, because making a film is working with hundreds of people and trying to make them understand what I'm trying to achieve. And at the same time, they give me new ideas and new uh, ways of looking at the film I'm trying to make. So it becomes very collaborative, but it means I've got to spend time with all these people. And it's sometimes you just want to be alone, but you can't be alone when you're directing a film. Do you think you'll ever animate again? I don't know if I can even move properly anymore <laughs> to animate. Uh, probably not. I mean, we've got this new Python stage show that we're, we're, we've been forced into doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, certain members of the group needed money. And so the others of us who are more successful than them uh, have agreed to help. And so we're going on stage again. Um, and I might have to do a few bits of animation to help. Um, bridge the different sketches in the show, but it, it doesn't interest me anymore. It was like, when I looked at the animation, it was as if it was done by another person. I don't even know who that guy is anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, I look at the ideas in there, I said, where did he get those ideas? And, uh, and a lot of people used to think the old Terry Gilliam took a lot of drugs to get those ideas, <laughs> but he didn't. He was a very clean living boy. <laughs> but he. He had the ability to get very tired by working very long hours, and somehow when you're in the middle of the night and you're exhausted, it's amazing how the world starts uh, inventing itself in new ways. The pieces of paper on my desk would move around and find new stories to tell. Uh, so that was, that was nice to discover. I had a lot of very interesting drugs inside my body, so I didn't have to spend large sums of money with the local dope dealer to get drugs to do the same job. Is it true that George uh, Harrison sponsored... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here, here. Is it true that George Harrison sponsored the Monty Python or some of the Monty Python? What happened was George became a friend uh, to us and he was kind of the number one Monty Python fan in the world. He could do all the sketches. Uh, whenever we would talk to him, he would suddenly say a line from one of the sketches and We'd sort of look at him and say, what are you talking about? Because we had forgotten the material. But when we were doing Life of Brian, uh, EMI was the, the big studio in England, and they were putting up the money for the film. And we had already done our um, recce's. We had gone to Tunisia and decided to shoot there. And the crew was going to leave on the Saturday to head down to um, begin preparing. And on the Thursday night, EMI called and said, we're out, we're not going to do the film. Which was a bit embarrassing for everybody and a bit terrifying. And what happened is that George Harrison, when he found out, he says, I'll put the money up to make the movie. And he did. He mortgaged his office building, they put up the money, and we made it. And as a result, we also formed a film, uh, a film company called um, Hand Handmade Films. And Handmade Films produced Life of Brian, Long Good Friday, uh, Private Function, uh, Private Sun Parade, Time Bandits. We went on and we made quite a few films uh, for some years and then eventually we, we separated the company sort of fell apart. So George was, that's how lucky we were that we actually had a patron like in the Renaissance. We had a Medici, he just happened to be a beetle. And, uh, <laughs> And he, he saved us. And that's how I made Time Bandits in the same way, because with Time Bandits, Michael Palin and I wrote the script, and uh, we took the script 
to have made. And then it, so and the handmaid went to Hollywood with the script. Nobody wanted to make the film. So George said, okay, we'll just put the money in and make the film. And we made the film, and then we went to Hollywood with the finished film, and no studio wanted to be involved. Uh, eventually, uh, we got a company called Alco Embassy, which was one of the smaller distributors. Or, or it had, had been at one point quite successful, but now it wasn't. And George, again, guaranteed, I can't remember how much money, for the prints and advertising, for the marketing budget. And the film went out using this small company, and it went to number one the first week, and it stayed in number one for about five weeks. It made more money than any film I've done in America. And this was a film that had been turned down several times by every studio. So, if you want to talk to studios, they're even worse now than they were then. So, don't get into that side of filmmaking if that's what you want to do. What's the element that usually makes you choose a subject? Is it an idea, an image, a fact of life? What's the beginning usually for you? I think they're all probably various things like that. It was like something like Time Babbits was really a result, result of us not getting to make Brazil. Uh, and so I got very frustrated and said, all right, I'm going to make a film for all the family. And one weekend, the idea came to me of, okay, we'll be about a boy traveling through time. And, but I thought, well, a child won't be able to hold his film together, so let's surround him with a group of people who are the same height, so we can shoot from a child's point of view. So let's have a bunch of bandits who are child size. And, and that was it, it's very simple, the idea of getting, finding heaven a boring place and you wanting to have some excitement in your life, so you go and start robbing through time and space. Uh, and you rob in one century, and then you go a few centuries before, before the crime was committed. Fantastic. And that was that how that worked. Something like uh, Baron Munchausen, I'd always loved the book, because uh, the book of the adventures of Baron Munchausen in the 1950s was second only to the Bible as far as a popular book. Uh, and it's been forgotten now, and, and so I love the idea of his adventures, so we, we started on that. Um, something like Brazil was me being incredibly angry and frustrated at what the modern world was like in 1980-something. And I just, I just hated the world and, and the way terrorism was being used to create stronger states and blah, blah, blah. And so that was the result of that one. And then, after Munchausen, which was a financial failure, I got very depressed and started to look at other people's scripts. And the script for Fisher King came in. And I read it and I thought, this is fantastic. I mean, the writing was so good, the characters were so wonderful, the idea was there. And, and the studio wanted to make it, so I thought, okay, I will break my rules and go and work on somebody else's script for a Hollywood studio, and again, that was not, went to number one. <laughs> and, and then something like 12 Monkeys was a script that nobody knew how to make. And I thought, well, that's good. Here's, if nobody knows how to do it, I can't, if I fail, I won't be compared to anybody else's attempt at it. <laughs> and it was such a, and again, it was a studio film, and the idea of getting a film with a story line like that through the studio was a, just an interesting adventure, because they didn't make films like that. And then other things have come along, like um, you know, Parnassus, I just wanted to write something again. Um, but it, it has to have an idea that is a view of the world that's fresh. Because that that's the only reason to make films, as far as I'm concerned, is to sort of open windows and doors to other ways of looking at the world. And you can either agree with me or not, or you might get you uh, inspired to do your own thing. Uh, but the films, hopefully, are the beginning of other people's adventures or creative attempts um, and that, that's kind of it if they're not if they're just there to entertain that doesn't interest me and action films are wonderful but I don't know how to make those so I, I do what I can uh, and uh, and I also like the idea of making films that don't are difficult to get made because I want to keep proving to distributors and studios that there are really 
many audiences out there, and there are a lot of intelligent people that if you give them a really intelligent film, they will come, they will respond, because the studios tend to think that we're all stupid, and we just want to see, you know, Fast and Furious 29, and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 110, and, uh, and all of those films are fine, but the idea that we just have to keep repeating the same ideas, because people just want to see the same thing again and again, is very depressing to me. So I would rather go against that way of thinking. Whether I'm right or wrong, uh, doesn't matter. I mean, it's clear the studios are more right than I am, because people keep coming to watch Fast and Furious 93. Um, and so there you go. Not to say that uh, Ooh, Stereo, stereo. Let's do the same tune, though. No. If you ask about Dr. Parnassus, because you talked about okay. it. And it's one of the most original films I've seen in ages. How did that evolve? I, I, was, I was just getting, uh, wanting to write something fresh. Uh, and, and my films are always in some way autobiographical. And it was kind of the mood I was in at that time. I was having difficulty getting money for my films. Uh, I was getting depressed that nobody was actually going to see them the way they were in, with my earlier films. And so it was me being Dr. Parnassus and saying, here's this magic, this extraordinary world, if you have the eyes to see it. And, uh, and Charles McEwen, who um, co-wrote Baron Munchausen with me and, and part of Brazil, we hadn't worked together for a long time, so it was nice just to come back together and see if we could create our own script and story. There it was. It was who was the guy that said? Yeah, here's. Let me ask you, uh, in your work, would you say that uh, you spend a lot of energy actively trying to avoid cliché and lazy ideas, or is it rather something that comes na more naturally in your creative process? Uh, the idea of me avoiding clichés, is, is, I'm just perverse. I mean, my attitude, if everybody else is making films like this, and thinking about the world like that, I want to go over here. I don't know what's over here, but it's more interesting to be over there. And I, yeah, I do try to avoid clichés because it's, well, they're cheating. It's easy to manipulate people with a cliché, so if I can avoid it. And sometimes when I try to do clichés, I fail. And so you think it's more interesting than it is. It's just that I tried to be cliché, and I failed. There's a lot of the work in my films is my failure to do what I really wanted to do. I mean, if I had, I, I was always excited by the fact that, um, no, frustrated and excited, that my failure to get the kind of films I wanted to make earlier, the big budgets and all, has at least saved me from making really mediocre movies. Because my ambition was to make really movies like everybody else made, and I keep failing at that because I can't get the money, or I'm just not good enough. And then you think I'm really clever and interesting, but no, I'm really boring. <laughs> so, you, yeah. uh, how is it like to work with Heath Ledger, and uh, how did you uh, manage to adapt the uh, script to Parnassus when he died? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've had a few problems in my, quote, career. But Heath's death was, um, was particularly um, just horrible because he was a really close friend. He was an extraordinary actor. I mean, that, that, there's a side of me that knows he was, without a doubt, the best actor of his generation, and he was just getting better and better. And to lose that is just horrible. Um, when, when Heath died, uh, right in the middle of Parnassus, uh, uh, we were in Vancouver. And Amy, my daughter, who is somewhere in the audience, uh, who was one of the producers on the film, uh, said, you've got to come into the, uh, my office. And I said, well, I'm busy. I'm trying to save some money in the art department. Just come in. And there it was on the BBC website. Heath is dead. And it made no sense, because we'd just seen him a couple of days before. And him dying was impossible. But he was dead. And so it just completely killed us. I mean, and I just said, it's over. The film is finished. Uh, we're going home. And then people like Amy and Nicola Pecorini, my cinematographer, they just kept beating me up and said, no, you've got to solve the problem. We're going to make this film. We're going to finish this film for Heath. And it took, I don't know, how long did it take? A couple of weeks before I started thinking again? Three. Three weeks, okay. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and then the idea, because 
it was suggested, oh, let's get another actor to replace Heath. Heath. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. Number one, you couldn't get an actor that good who would be available, that because we had to keep working. We'd, and uh, and then it just struck, struck me that, well, the character goes through the mirror three times. Let's get three friends. And again, Amy forced me to uh, call Johnny Depp. And Johnny, because what was happening at that point, all the money, the bankers and everybody were leaving. They were going home because you can't finish a film when the star is dead in the middle of it like that. And, and Johnny said, you know, whatever you want, I'll be there. And that, when the money people heard that, ooh, they started, <laughs> their retreat, they slowed down. Oh, really? Uh, and then uh, we just started looking for other friends of Heath's. And, and Colin and, and Jude were friends. Because I wanted to keep it in the family and hand it to people who knew him and were doing it for the right reasons. And, and Colin and Jude said yes, and Johnny, we finally got Johnny on board. It's one thing for Johnny to say yes, it's another thing to organize his, uh, his schedule. And it worked out, and we made the film, and when people see it, it's, they can't imagine that it wasn't written that way. But I didn't change the script at all. It's exactly the same. And what is so disturbing is when Johnny is talking and you're seeing little boats go past with uh, Princess Di and James Dean about living, uh, dying young, never growing old. In fact, these were all words that were in the original script. Uh, and it was very spooky to think we had written in a death in, in there without knowing it. Um, there's even a scene in there, which I won't tell you which one it is, which we shot, and Heath is in it, but Heath was dead when we shot it. It was a couple, a couple months after he died, and nobody has spotted the scene, and he's there. <laughs> so, uh, I think we, everybody worked very hard, and we managed to make it happen, and, and so, uh, for me, the film is not only one of my favorite films, but it's also the most extraordinary achievement that we managed to out of a disaster to turn out a really wonderful film. So. Uh, can you say yeah. some uh, a few words about the last uh, uh, film that you made and you we will see tonight? Tonight. So the first screening and I hope that the first and only last. screening. <laughs> yes, but tonight. I hope that it will be Unless not the last. Unless you make a lot of noise tonight. <laughs> I'm hearing talk from the distributors that they're not going to put it out in the cinema and only do it on DVD. Ah. Yes, thank you. It's a disgrace, and we're going to burn down the city if this is what happens. <laughs> Bucharest must be sacrificed. <laughs> um, the Zero Theorem was, again, every my default, as you know, in computers, you've got your default position uh, when you go back to things. And the default position for me is Don Quixote, foolishly, stupidly. Um, and, and we were working on Don Quixote uh, a year ago, and suddenly the money fell through. And so last July, I didn't have a job, and I was very determined that I was going to make a film that year. And the Zero Theorem was a script that had been floating around four or five years before, and Never, I never got involved in it properly. And the producer was still interested in doing it. And so he said, yeah, let's do it. The difference was the budget four or five years ago was one price, and we ended up doing it for a third of that money, basically. Um, and that's why we had to come to Bucharest. Because Bucharest is lovely and cheap. And, uh, but, and, and I really am grateful for having had a chance to come to Bucharest. <laughs> Is, uh, I fall in love with this place. Uh, and uh, anyway, the script was an odd script. It was full of good ideas and uh, an interesting aspect, uh, personal or existential ideas, let's put it that way. And uh, I just jumped into it, and we got a crew together. And from, I think, the third week of July, I got Christoph Waltz to agree to be in it. And by October 5th, we were shooting the film. I mean, for anybody who's ever been involved in filmmaking, this is impossible to go from that point to shooting in short, such a short time. And, uh, 
that I just got a lot of friends to come in and, and be part of the process. Matt Damon and Tilda Swinton and David Thewlis, Ben Whishaw. Uh, and it was a very, I, I suppose, frenetic experience because we had very little time to um, prepare it. We had to build this incredible chapel at uh, Media Pro Studios. We had to get permission to shoot on the streets of Bucharest. Uh, by the bank of Mamarosh mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and on Cal Vittoria, uh, which isn't in the film. Finally, I'm sorry to say, uh, but it was it was just a very fast process, which we shot in a very short time. We finished the film and then went back to London, and it took us nine months to finally finish the film uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it was an interesting experience where in the editing, in many ways we kind of rewrote the movie. Uh, it always happens in editing, I move things around, but this was more um, more interesting because uh, we had a lot of material that was interesting itself, but it needed to be restructured to make the film work. Um, and in the end, I think we ended up with a really fine film. Uh, and the performances are quite wonderful. Uh, Emil, are you here? Emil Hostina is in the film. He was in Dr. Parnassus. He lives in Bucharest. He is Romanian and he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> and he hasn't even seen the film yet. If he had seen it, he had a reason for being not being here, maybe. <laughs> but he's not. Anyway, so yeah, it, it was just a very interesting experience to work that way where I didn't do storyboarding like I normally do. It was, it was just working on instinct, and we brought in, I think, only about four or five people from outside of Romania, and everybody else was from here in Bucharest. Um, and it was, it was a great experience to see how hard people work here, and how skilled they are, and, and how good the meat is here. Uh, <laughs> uh, because these are important things when you're making a film, to be with people that laugh a lot, that work very hard, and can cook. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> your, your battles with, uh, in, in the lines between uh, being an artist and dealing with the banks are, are legendary. Um, if the world completely changed, mm. and all of a sudden you actually had the resources you needed to make whatever you wanted to make, yeah. what would you make? Probably a mediocre film. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it's, it's a very fine balance between working under the, the constriction of a small budget or whatever and, and with my, and my ideas. But more often in the past what has happened is because I couldn't do what I wanted to do because of whatever, uh, we came up with solutions, solutions that were actually more interesting, more surprising. And for me, part of it is when you're making a film, you think about it for a long time in advance. You plan it, you, you see the shots, you, you've got very strong images I do in my head. And then when you start making it, when things go wrong, it becomes alive again in a strange way. Because if it's going too smoothly, it's just like a factory product being made. And it's the blockages that make me start thinking new ideas or listening to other people who have another idea that might be better. And, and that's... That's the only way I've ba basically worked. So if I was given everything I wanted, I don't know what I would do. I'd probably just go in 10 million different directions and, and not, not able to focus. It's the limitations that makes me focus and say, all right, what's important here? I want all these things, but okay, you can't have them. So which are the ones that are really important? Which are the things that you won't give up? You know, get rid of those. Okay, I can live without those. And I think that's what... The, the restrictions do for me. They really make me focus because I'm very greedy otherwise. So, yeah. um. What are some of your favorite movies? And also, how can, how can you build a career without a patron in today's world? Without a what? Without a patron, a renaissance type patron. How can you build a career as a film director? You can't. You need your Medici. You need your Beatle. No, I don't know. <laughs> You, career is, no, the trick is not to have a career. So then you don't have to build it. Yeah, then you're free. Without a career, life is possible. 
<laughs> Careers kill you. So I've never had a career in my life. It's only looking back. It looks like I had a career. I just went, I didn't, I banged my head against a brick wall for a year or two. Then I realized that, oh, I could just walk around the wall. <laughs> or I could look another direction. So it's like, you, it's, it's, I don't know. I, mean, I think I've been very lucky, to be quite honest, because I wanted to make films, but I, and I lived in Los Angeles, and I hated the Hollywood system. And it took me, you know, leaving America, going to England, you know, getting involved in Monty Python, Monty Python becoming successful. And our first films were, we had patrons. Um, our first films were, uh, like well, Life of Brian or uh, Holy Grail, were financed, well, Holy Grail in particular, were financed by Elton John, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Genesis. All these groups had all of this money and the tax situation in London and England at that time was brutal. You, had, you could end up paying as much as 90, 90% tax. And so they were trying to get rid of their money and we were waiting, hi. <laughs> and, and so we learned by making films, because having not really gone to film school or any of that, and I only know films by watching films and, and think I understand the vocabulary. Uh, and so Terry Jones and I, because we were in a position that we were given this money to make the, the movie, we said we're, we'll be the directors. And the others let us. And, uh, and so we learned. We learned by making huge mistakes, but somehow we got through it, so each time, my, 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 my film student career is still not over. I'm still trying to learn, out, learn how you make movies. <laughs> uh, but getting started is really hard, and I, I'm not able to really say how you do it, except you've got to be committed. You've got to be so dedicated. It's got to be the most important thing in your life, and you've got to have patience, and you just keep hammering away, and eventually there's a crack in the, in the brick wall. <laughs> And hopefully you get through it. But you can make things now. I mean, it's there's no reason you can't tell stories on film or digital now. You've got an iPhone. You've got a little thing. You can make it. I mean, when I first started out, I, I was living in New York and I was editing a magazine, and I saved up money to buy a 16 mil millimeter Bolex camera and a tape recorder, and I was rooming with two other guys, one was a cartoonist and one was a writer. And every weekend we would buy a three minute roll of film and we'd write a little story and we'd go out and shoot it. And they were terrible films, but by doing it you kind of learn how to tell a story. And, um, and now with digital, it's so easy to do now. You, there's no reason not to do it. Whether anybody sees it is something else, but that's always secondary. Just start telling stories, and with digital, well, there's enough outlets where you can show somebody your work, and then, if it's good, they'll say, oh, come and do something for us, or blah, blah, it works that way. And that's, that has never changed. Uh, I mean, I was thinking about Zero Theorem. Uh, I needed a moment, we were editing in, in London, and Christoph Waltz was in Vienna, and uh, I changed the scene, and I needed different dialogue for it. And so I just sent him the old dialogue, emailed it to him, and, um, and then he got his iPhone out and he recorded the new lines. He gave me several takes, emailed it back, it's in the film. I mean, there's, I, I did, there's a whole sequence where I'm doing a voice on one bit. Got my iPhone out, recorded it. The, the, the film, I mean, the, the microphone in the iPhone is extraordinary. It's really, it's professional level. So. This is how we make these things. <laughs> and you can put it on the web, you get a Facebook, you put a little film up there. Maybe somebody will like it. Um, I don't know what else to suggest. <laughs> My favorite films. Oh, I've got a lot, too many. Uh, I don't know. Pinocchio. Walt Disney's Pinocchio. I love it. Eight and a Half. Paths of Glory. Um, Seven Samurai. Seven Seal. Seven Seal. I mean, they all came from around the same time, late 50s, early 60s. There was a period of filmmaking around the world. And it was a time when all the world cinema would come to places like New York. And you could just watch it all. Now you can watch everything on DVD, and there's no reason not to. You can have access to more films now than you've ever been able, any of us have ever been able to. So the stuff is there. You just have to keep working at it. Uh, and 
And what is favorite for me is, I don't know, it's not really interesting to me because what's more important to me is reading books. Films are secondary. I mean, books are more important because it's a single voice. I mean, most of the films I talked about are a single voice film with a director who has a very clear story idea to tell, and that's important. Um, but I find literature more important, and, and paintings, to be honest, and then film is just another media to work in. I, I love film because I love, uh, you're, you're involved with painting, you're involved with literature, you're involved with dance, theater, music, everything is there in a film. And that's what's exciting about film filmmaking. In your own experience, um, would you say the chase is better than the catch in the sense that you enjoy working on a movie more than having a finished product or the other way around? Uh, no, it's really both. I mean, I like, the best part of making a movie is when you're doing location, writing and location scouting, because it's all a possibility then. The next good bit is the editing, because you're restricted by the pieces that you've assembled, and now you've got to <coughs> stitch them together into a fabric or into something that is a film. The worst part <coughs> is the shooting, because uh, that's just hard, hard work, and you're making mistakes every day. Things are going wrong. Um, no, it's both, but, but what I'm really happy in the end is that I've made several films, and they exist, and that's sort of, that's, those are my initials scrawled on a tree, and unless, until the tree falls over, I exist, and the film's uh, the only way I exist in, you know, um, I don't watch my own films, I'm always surprised by them, because, uh, yeah, but I'm, what I'm really, what, what I like most, I suppose, ultimately, is that some people are really affected by the movies. They really affect them, they change them, they make them look at the world differently, they inspire them. That's what's really exciting. And hopefully they make better films than I made, that's all. That would be the great, great way of looking at things. I would like to ask also a question. Okay. Okay. It's, oh, I'm out there, hello. <laughs> uh, it's related to the degree like this, better than like this. You're better like that. Uh, no. <laughs> I discovered I was a lousy writer after I started making movies. <laughs> That's why I have to work with somebody else all the time. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I was, yeah, listen, you grow up watching movies. You live, you know, in Los Angeles. Movies are there, they're being made. You know people that work on them. Movies, you know, I just wanted to make movies from a very early age, but I didn't know how to make movies, and I had no facility for working my way up through a system. I'm no good at that. I can only come in at the top and then work my way down. <laughs> it's what I do, and that's what I've done, whether it's in animation, <laughs> whether it's filmmaking, uh, whether it's uh, um, um, working in magazines. I always start at the top, and then little by little, uh, either get bored, get less good, get older, uh, or I fail more and more. <laughs> Toward me. The architecture is such a wonderful mixture, uh, you know, and that, that's what I love. So walking in Bucharest just excites me. I turn a corner, oh, there's a beautiful Art Deco building. I turn another corner, oh, this is this ancient church. And then there's a terrible communist block over there. Yeah. And then there's the, the Radisson Blue. Oh, no. Um, and it's, like, it's, it's such a mixture. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's, uh, and, and I found, I just... I like the atmosphere here. I like the people. I find people here have good senses of humor. They seem to be quite relaxed. Um, it may be my fantasy, but that's what it feels like. Uh, but it's the size of the city is very beautiful, nice, and the parks are everywhere. Uh, the sad thing is to watch the old buildings, particularly the you know the, the neo Romanesque buildings, which are just extraordinary, all deteriorating because nobody can decide who owns them or whether anybody's going to put any money into them uh, to restore them. And that's the sad thing. And I think there's obviously a lot of people here who are making a lot of money very quickly, tearing down nice old buildings and building some rather shitty uh, new buildings. But there you go. Last year when we were shooting in Bucharest, the most exciting thing I discovered was, and this is, you know, 
former, former communist country, a uh, place where socialism was alive, that last year in Bucharest, there were over 50, 5 Ferraris sold. So I'm glad everybody's equal here in Bucharest. <laughs> 50! This is ridiculous! There weren't 50 in London. Where's the money? It's in the hands of a few people. Yeah. We need the revolution. That's yes! The <laughs> How did you end up working on Tideland? Tideland. Tideland um, was a book that was sent to me by the writer. Um, and he just wanted me to read it and give him a quote for the, the publisher to put on, uh, on the book. And I, uh, and I gave him a quote, which is, uh, um, <laughs> fucking marvelous, as I think was the quote, which was on the cover. And, but I, I, I really loved the book. I loved the idea of this little girl, the kind of Alice, modern Alice in Wonderland, being put through these very stressful, difficult situations and surviving. Uh, and, um, and so I just got excited by it. And, Tony Grizzoni and I wrote the script from the book, and we went off and shot it in, in Canada. And I, I really love that movie because it's it's quite disturbing for a lot of people because it's not showing children the way we normally see children in film or television. It's dealing with things. I think uh, I remember people. This is the way the world. The calendar section of the Los Angeles Times, which is the entertainment cultural section, refused to give us any space in there because the early scene, I don't know, if, for those of you who've seen it, there's an early scene where Jeff Bridges is um, sitting there and his daughter, little nine and a half year old girl, is a ten year old girl, is preparing something in the kitchen and basically she's cooking heroin and she puts it in the needle and goes over and helps her father inject. Now, people walked out at that point. People were really angry. What are you doing here? A child with heroin and a junkie father? And what they couldn't see is a dance between a father and his daughter. And the daughter was the, the nurse, the elder one, trying to give her father what her father needed. And and it was and I, I shot it like a dance, so it was very elegant and beautiful. And all they could see that it's a child with heroin. That's bad. And they stopped thinking. And that that's why I make the film to shock those people into thinking or walking out and maybe get some other people who are willing to think about these relationships and what they may or may not mean. Are you, how did you come up with the lizard scene in uh, Fear and Nothing in, La, in Las Vegas? How it came up with what? Lizard scene. The lizard scene. The lizard. 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 Oh, no. oh, well, in the book, I mean, it was just, everything in the script is in the book. Basically, and and in the book, there's the character um, Johnny's character is hallucinating, and he looks and everybody looks like lizards. So we made it. We made lizards, and and we just try to make them be as obscene as possible. <laughs> and so it's just ugly and disturbing. And but basically, it's just people inside lizard suits, um, greased up, and doing obscenity. <laughs> No, I don't recommend books for filmmakers. I recommend books. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, what would you like to? How about uh, some Dostoevsky? Okay, easy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, what am I? I'm trying to rem remember what I'm reading right now. I just fully finished an old Philip K. Dick book that I read 30 years ago. I've just finished a book called Goliath, which is about the current state of Israel and Palestine. Uh, I'm reading a book on the Glau the Glaoui, the last uh, of the lords of the Atlas, the, uh, the Berber chieftains in Morocco. I'm reading a book on that. Uh, what else am I reading? I just read things. Uh, and I think, if you're going to be a filmmaker, you, what are the stories you want to tell? That's the thing you've got to ask yourself. Uh, do you just want to entertain people? That's fine, that's good. Uh, do you want to uh, try to change uh, society? Well, then inform yourself. Uh, I just, I just want to use 
film as a way of educating people, or, or at least, if not educating them, uh, making them think maybe it's worth reading a book or looking at something. Uh, it doesn't matter. I just think film schools tend to, obviously, uh, focus on theory and te technical things, which is fine. It's good to learn those. Structure. Um, a structure could be, you know, if you understand literary structure, you'll understand, or theatrical structure, you'll understand film structure. Um, but those are the things, but it's not filling your head with ideas about the world. It's really, have an attitude towards the world, and then make, make a film. <laughs> How do you work with the actors, and what makes a good actor, in your opinion? I mean, my trick is to cast very carefully. If I cast the right actor, my job is done. It's really simple. Um, if they're the right person for that particular part. So I spend a lot of time being very careful. And I also want to work with people who are fun to work with, who are intelligent, who are wonderful actors. So you start by working with, it's just like you know, making a meal. Let's get good material to work with, good tomatoes, you know, good lettuce, a really fine meat. And so I approach it that way. And then, then we just spend time, you know, you go to dinner, you talk about the character, you talk about what the film is, you just share thoughts. So by the time we start working, we're basically making the same film, that's the first thing. And then I, I suppose I try to be, I keep the atmosphere very relaxed and fun. So hopefully, that's why I like people with senses of humor, because we can laugh, and then we can do a very tragic scene, and then go back to laughing about something. Um, and then, I suppose, the next thing, I guess I, I, I become a good audience, is what I try to do. So, because I tend to use wide-angle lens, so I'm fairly close to the actor. And, and so I, I'm trying to respond to what they're doing. If they're, you know, being tragic, I want to weep. If they're being funny, I want to laugh. So, and I do. And it's, there's not much more than that. And then it's just like, you say, oh, a little bit more, a little bit less, a little faster, a little bit slower. And that's it. There's not, nothing more to it, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't train actors. I want actors who are already trained. Um, and that's why it's also nice working with children, because they're not trained, and yet they love playing. And acting is just playing, is all it is. And with, with children, which I've seen have done an awful lot of films with children. And it's, so you just play with it, and you slowly bring it out. I, I don't know what else, because I never learned acting or acting techniques. Um, I, it's, it's that. I mean, a good actor for me is somebody who uh, gets rid of their ego, who becomes the character, who becomes totally no vanity. Whatever the character needs, they do. And, and I try to make them feel comfortable that it's safe to fall on your face, to go too far. You know, because sometimes some people are so nervous they're holding back. And I just like, let them go. See what happens, and if it's too much, okay, come on, you don't have to uh, pull it back. That's all. I don't really know any more than that. Uh, but um, it seems to work, is all I know. <laughs> Whatever it is, I do. And also, I try to get actors to do characters that they don't only, normally play. So someone like Brad Pitt in 12 Monkeys. Before that, Brad was very laconic, very slow speaking, you know, blah, 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 kind of And the idea of him being this motor mouth, all that going on was incredible. He worked very hard uh, and he got there. And he was, I put him together with a good uh, coach who encouraged him. So that by the time he came to work, he was just firing. It was fantastic. And then someone like Bruce Willis in the same movie, I said, well, Bruce, here's the deal. I want you to come as Bruce Willis actor, not Bruce Willis superstar. You can't bring your entourage and all that crap. You gotta just come. Just you. That's all I'm interested in. And, and I think it's one of his best performances because he really went in, he internalized it, and he, he stopped doing you know, a lot of the things. Actually, I did give him some rules. I said, you can't be that stupid smirk you do. <laughs> and you can't be this little, you know, putting your mouth and you're nervous. It's very feminine. And it's like, and you can't do the steely eyes. You can't do that stuff. But that was it. <laughs> Oh, ha let's see, I had Meech for lunch, so I'm not, I don't have to worry about Meech. Uh, 
Um, well, well, foolishly, in two days, I'll be somewhere in the Canary Islands looking for locations for the man who killed Don Quixote. <laughs> Let's see if it's lucky seven. What Maybe happened not. in the previous ones? What? What happened in the previous ones? No, it's just money. It's always money. The money falls apart. Because because the studio, unless I, you know, there's an interesting situation with Don Quixote because when we began it long ago, Johnny Depp was in it. Now everybody in the studio will say, ah, oh, why isn't Johnny in it? Well, Johnny's, you know, 12 years older. <laughs> He's no longer the young, the young guy that we started the movie with. It's, He's getting old, and so, and so that confuses them. Uh, and then it's a matter of finding the right actor who is, in the terms of the business, is bankable. And it's all about money. It's nothing. And who is bankable this week might not be bankable next week. It all depends. It's, you'll be working with people who, you know, they're brilliant actors. And they've had some great hits, but say for a couple of years they haven't had any big hits. They suddenly stop being bankable. That's the way the business works, and uh, and so this next time I, I've got to find the bankable guy who's right for the part. <laughs> we'll see. Do you know who Don Quixote is now? No, no, I don't know anything. <laughs> I, just, uh, I know nothing. No. <laughs> I'm blank. <laughs> I go. I look for locations. I see. <laughs> Maybe one in the middle, I don't know, mountain, we see what happens, I don't know. Are you strongly in favor, are you strongly in favor of using film as opposed to shooting in digital? Do you think there's value that can be achieved? Not at your age. It doesn't make any difference. If go whatever is cheaper. Now we, this is the thing, I will let you in on a big, big thing here. The Zero Theorem is the first one-size-fits-all, full-gate, semi-vinyl motion picture. First one ever made. You want to know what that means? <laughs> okay, so we shot on film. No, no, I'm doing it the wrong direction. Okay, one-size-fits-all. We shot in the proportion of 16 by 9, as opposed to 185 by, by 1 or 235, which is why it's straight. 16 by 9, which is what you see on your modern television sets, on your iPad, on your iPhone. 16 by 9, so it's one size fits all, so everybody, whatever medium or however you watch it, you'll see exactly the same image, no more, no less, than what you see on the big screen. Second thing is full gate. Now, when you shoot a film, what the camera, the film goes through the camera, and there's the gate which is the, the gate where the light comes through. And it's got rounded corners. And normally in film, modern film, you use a safe area within that so that any of the dirt that catches in the camera when you're shooting isn't, isn't visible. Well, we've shown the full gate. No safety net on this one, safety area. And so it's got little rounded corners, which is the whole thing. Now, it then, even though we shot on film, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is analog, as opposed to digital, which is digital. And vinyl is analog, so that's the part of vinyl. The semi-vinyl part is it's semi-film. But there's 250 digital effect shots in there, so that's the other, that's the other semi, the non-vinyl part. And that's the motion picture. That's, anyway, this is just besides the film, but it's games you play to entertain yourself when you spend a year and a half on a film. <laughs> No, no, I mean, years ago, we wrote a script for The Watchmen, uh, and it never got made, uh, and, then, and that was it, so Zach, uh, Zach Snyder made his version, and, uh, what? Why didn't you do that? What happened? Um, Watchmen is a very expensive movie, and, and that was it, and if you don't get the right cast, it's not going to get made. It's making movies, especially if you're making Something like that, which is a big budget movie. You've got to get the right people, you've got to have the right producers, you've got to have all these people to get the money out of the studios. And the combination wasn't right, and it didn't happen. 
And in a strange way, I was relieved because trying to reduce The Watchmen into a two-hour, 15-minute film was kind of destroying what The Watchmen was about. I mean, I think I, I said at the time, Watchmen would be best as a, as a series of five films, just like the book was. Um, and that's it. So, but I, I don't know. Are they making another one? I don't know about that. Uh, no, I don't have a film edited in my head at all. I mean, I've got some ideas. I mean, there, there are sequences, bits that are pretty clear. Now, the rest is just shooting a scene. You get in there, today we're doing that scene. Let's try to work it out. I, I used to storyboard things very carefully. I don't know. I mean, it's more like, let's go go in there. We'll just rehearse the scene. Let's see, move around. You go there, you sit there. Okay, that's working. Like Now we just cover it. We shoot it. Okay, we'll do a wide, we'll do some tight shots. I don't know where the cuts are going to be. I don't waste time with that. Just get coverage done. And then we, we fix it in the editing room. Um, then, as far as audiences have changed, I, I think so. I mean, I, it's been, it's been a, a long time of dumbing the audiences down, giving them the same kind of juvenile you know, films that we keep seeing again and again and again. And I mean, it's been 20-some years of watching men in slow motion run from explosions. And I, you know, this is, come on, stop it. I mean, there's got to be other things to say in movies. And, and I, I, I go and I watch trailers, and I keep seeing well, all those trailers. It's the same movie. I mean, the costumes look different, different actors, but they're telling the same kind of stories. Uh, and there's, I mean, I'm not saying they're bad movies, because some of them are very, very good. There's good performances and writing, and te technically they're brilliant. But I think, somehow I just think, if you keep giving people a limited... Um, selection of food, they will get used to that rather than asking for the whole range. And all I can do is compare it to what it was like in the 60s and 70s when it was, what you could see in the cinema was just incredible. I mean, you know, you'd have just, it's just easy to see an Italian film as it is a French film, or a Spanish film, or a German film, or a Yugoslavian film, it didn't matter. It was alive and everybody was excited and now people seem to be well, they're, they're trained in the same way people who eat McDonald's hamburgers are trained. You know what you're going to get. You go in there, and, and and most of the films are like a pop song now. You know the rhythm of them. You know it's going to go uh, a bit slow, and then there's going to be an action sequence, and then we'll come out and we'll do a little bit, and boom, the next one. And it's like you could also you just play the, the song behind it, and you know what it's going to be. And for a lot of people, that's very comforting. They go to the cinema, and they escape, and it feels good. But I've always been more interested in, in making people feel a little unsettled. <laughs> you come out, you're not sure what you feel sometimes, but it makes you think. And it may leave uh, scars inside of you that might stay with you a long time. I mean, that's what happened. I'm basically, that's what cinema did for me. I, mean, I have things stuck in my head, images, ideas that have come from the films I loved, and they will never go away. And so I'm trying to pass on that pain to other people. <laughs> Last question. I'm sorry, but oh, it's... Do you have a dream like a, like being a filmmaker? Do you have a special wish for which you uh, go for it when you when you try to make a movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just get up in the morning and say, oh, fuck this. This is 6 o'clock. What am I doing? <laughs> And then you get down there, and it's cold, and it's miserable, and you've got to go to work, and yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's... I'm sorry, but... Do you still get nervous? What? Do you still get nervous when your movies are participating in a competition? I, I try not to have my uh, movies in competition, so I can't lose that way. <laughs> no, I don't get nervous. No, I don't get nervous about it. It's, I never know, when you finish a film, like zero theorem, I'm still not sure if I know what the film is. I'm too close to it. Uh, and it's, uh, and I just sort of rely on other people's reactions to tell me, that, oh, you've done a good job, or you failed miserably. I don't know. <laughs> Should famous directors step away after a few minutes from competition? Well, I was on the jury in Cannes several years ago, and there was a uh, Jean-Luc Godard film. 
he should have stepped away. <laughs> but Godard is a great filmmaker. There was a certain, yeah, I, 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 you think I should stop is what you're asking me. <laughs> Huh? Are you ever afraid of failing with a movie or with a project? Yeah, always, but then I'm very quick to try to def redefine failure. There can be so many ways you can redefine failure to take the pain away. <laughs> no, what I mean is to give a chance to the other No, old filmmakers should not get out of the way for, so young <laughs> filmmakers can grow. We are the giants in the forest, and we spread the shade, and we stop everything else from growing. And I, uh, a couple of years ago, at the European Film Awards, I won for the best short film. And I said, most people's career but begins by making short film and working their way up to big Hollywood movies. Mine is going in the opposite direction. And I said, I probably held back several young film directors by several years by winning this prize. And I said, fuck them, I'm keeping it. 